I'll go. Um, welcome everyone tonight to Pitch to Podcast featuring Pushkin Industries. We're really excited to have everyone here, um, especially as the last few trickle in from the waiting room. Um, I'm Lily Clark, Duke class of 2022 and an exec member of here at Duke, which is Duke Student Run Audio Collective. Before we get rolling, I wanna say a big thank you to this episode's co-sponsors, Demon Live, whom we love, and Duarts, um, who we also love. Um, they're so great. Um, please be aware that this Zoom session is being recorded so folks can stream it later at their convenience on Demon Live. Now I get to introduce our moderator, Arlene Arevalo from the class of 21. She's an aspiring writer in the Studio Duke program and my fellow exec member from here at Duke. Thank you so much, Julie, for that intro. I'm really excited to be in conversation with our panelists tonight and to people in our chat who are watching, please feel free to post your questions for the panelists in the chat. So to kick things off, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. You can find their full bios on the Demon Life episode page. First up, we have John Schnars, Duke class of 2005 and vice president of business development at Pushkin Industries. Hi, John. Hi, Arlene. <laughs> and next up, we have Brittany Brown, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, class of 2012, and associate producer at Pushkin as well. Hi, Brittany. Hello, Arlene. We're super excited to have you here with us. And just to kick things off, our first question is for John. So this is a slightly more personal question. So I was surprised to discover that you were a lit major at Duke. I'm also a lit major. And I'm curious to just kind of find out how your studies of literature at Duke kind of informed your career and prepared you for your current line of work. Uh, really good question. We were few but mighty uh, in my time. I think there were 12 of us in my year. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is, I don't, I mean, I loved the literature program. I, I, it was something that I sort of backed into a little bit, uh, mostly because I was interested in film and sort of cinema studies. And they, they all just kind of happened to cross list for the most part in literature. Um, but that said, when I, so I, when I sort of like finally made the calls, like, all right, literature it is, uh, and, and went that direction, um, you know, I mean, it, 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 it teaches you like a lot of, I think the liberal arts do, critical thinking, analysis, writing, so on and so forth. Um, you know, but really I think it it challenged me to just, to to hone my skills as a critical thinker and a writer. And, and that's something that just is gonna benefit anyone in any career. Um, I did leave Duke thinking I wanted to be in sort of journalism and, and media. And so it felt like the right thing. Um, took a little bit of a winding path to get where I am today, I guess though. Yeah, that was a great answer. I feel like most lit majors, we are still few and mighty, but we're very passionate. Um, <laughs> but I feel like most of us also stumble our way into that. And I think also similar to journalism or audio, that's something that you just find yourself doing, right? Instead of like a clear path. Well, I was, I was chronicle for four years. So, you know, that's, okay. that's a little bit more of a straighter line, right. um, but yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. So our next question is for Brittany. So before you found your way at Pushkin, you worked at filmmaking. You had your own film production company, Barbara Jean Productions. And you also said that you'd wanted to be a lawyer when you were still in college. So can you just talk about how you had all these different ideas of what you wanted to do? You had like parent expectations and pressures on, on what to do. So can you just talk about how all of those ideas and paths led you to where you end up ended up today? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I just, I feel like I have that in common. I feel like it's in common with a lot of like young people who start to, you know, they're in college and, you know, you're trying to figure yourself out. And I just thought I wanted to be a lawyer. That's all I really, that's all that really came to mind when I was a young, a young person. I mean, you know, I come from a very political town, the DC area, everybody that works for the government or they work in politics. And so I just figured I'd kind of just get on that bandwagon. But uh, towards the latter end of my undergrad, I realized that I had a interest in more so communications and film and media and so right after college I started my own production company and I was pretty much running around with my um with my cousin and filming him and just doing things that I just enjoyed and um and I'm glad that I did that um and after that I was able to basically go to New York um by way of uh, Viacom and after that uh I was able to you know, just kind of stumble into podcasting. I always tell folks that podcasting found me. And so um, I thought that was great. And coming from a filmmaking world and 
in being very much immersed in the audio world now is like it's almost like they're they're married and they're conjoined <laughs> and so um pushkin just came about as a result of me doing that me pursuing my interests and um pushkin was introduced me introduced to me through a uh, a coworker of mine, a previous coworker of mine, who presented the opportunity to me, and it was like, "Hey, I think you'd be in, in a, uh, interested in this project that they have called Beyond the Last Dance." And I was—I played basketball my whole life, and um, I was very much involved in you know sports and things like that. So it was easy. And so when they recommended me for it, I was like, "Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it." And they liked me, and so that was last summer. And now I'm um, now I'm full time, and I couldn't be couldn't be happier because everything seemed to line up exactly the way that it was supposed to. <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like also so validating to hear. <laughs> and I also like what you said about stumbling into podcasting. I think that kind of echoed what John was saying about how he had these different interests and how kind of podcasting found him. So I think it's comforting that it feels like an industry where there's like such a hodgepodge of people who are interested in so many different things. So it's, mm -hmm. I guess it's refreshing to, to kind of hear that from you. So our next question is for John. Uh, before running business development at Pushkin, you worked in marketing at Google and you also went to business school. So what are some of the differences between like working in marketing at Google and then now running business development for Pushkin? Like what were the differences and what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities like? Uh, the differences are almost too numerous to, to count. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had a very, we talked about having a winding path to the literature program and sort of how that, you know, benefited, but also was uh, maybe came away, uh, came from maybe a lack of planning in some ways. Um, you know, I think my career has evolved in, in similar fashion. I mean, and not all the, not too dissimilar from, from Brittany in, in some ways, but um you know, I found myself at Google, I was probably like five or six years out of undergraduate. Um, and it, I felt so fortunate to be at that place. I had, I had started a startup, you know, and that had gone under in 2008, 2009, around the sort of financial crisis. Um, and so when I got to Google, it was like, I'm just, I felt like kid in a candy store. I was like, I'm taking advantage of this, you know, for everything that I can. This is like, just like general advice I give folks is like, if you have a chance at a big company like that. And it can be Google, it can be a lot of different companies. There's always opportunities, right? There's like learning and development opportunities. There's just like networking opportunities within the, it's like, I was the person just give me all of it at once. And so, um, yeah, so I had the chance to just develop in a ton of different directions, like product, working with product folks and product and engineering and, you know, understanding, you know, how a company goes from, beta testing or even alpha testing an idea to scaling it across the globe, you know, to literally millions or even potentially billions of users. So um, super interesting, uh, you know, and it also Google's at the heart of marketing and advertising. And so you kind of get that holistic, at least from a digital perspective, understanding of that, of the sort of digital marketing ecosystem. And it's really exciting. I mean, it's a great place to start a career. It's a great place to kind of have a career. I mean, you know, to build a career, there's no lack of innovation and, and just, you know, there's always something new going on. Um, that said, like I had always had a passion for podcasting. And so, uh, you know, folks, I think it's in my bio. Uh, I, I started my own podcast in 2007. Um, you know, and that kind of grew out of the fact that when I was out of college, I wasn't working at the Chronicle. I really wanted to be writing more. I started writing with some friends on a website. We turned that into a podcast. You know, fast forward 14 years, we're still doing that effectively on a weekly basis. So we put out like 50 shows a year, um, which, you know, it's, it, is a, it is a hobbyist production. It is not a Pushkin sort of like level, you know, production, <laughs> but, but we love it. We have like a dedicated kind of crew of, of fans who have been with us for a really long time. Um, you know, and so that there, that's like a direction that people come can come to this through. But so I spent, you know, 12 years in podcasting. Um, I was podcasting before people knew what a podcast was in a lot of cases. Um, and so, you know, I went, you mentioned, I went to business school. I did that sort of toward the tail end of my Google career. And again, like a company like Google, you, I, can't, I can't say enough nice things about the way that empowered me to go and explore my MBA. I did that on a part-time basis while I was still working. Um, but it also put me on a path to like leaving Google, you know, making an initial kind of next step in my career. I spent a couple of years at a, at a sort of 
social media agency, still in advertising, um, but with this passion to kind of move back toward a media, you know, and, and podcasting specifically business if I could. Um, and at that point, I knew, you know, I had spent a decade in digital advertising. I knew that if I was going to get into podcasting, it was not going to be sort of the path that Brittany's blazed in, you know, and getting in through production and, you know, and learn, I just don't, I don't know enough about cutting tape and, and how that works. Could I have learned, you know, as a 38 year old man, maybe, yeah, probably <laughs> it's like possible, but, um, you know, I had, I had my MBA, I had a solid business background. I had marketing experience, you know, I have, I had a lot of other things I could bring to the table. And I, I also had run a podcast for 14 years or 12 years or whatever at the time. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I feel super fortunate to have found myself where I am. Um, you know, I, when I initially started at Pushkin, I was responsible for running finance, you know, and I, I'm, I'll be forthright in saying like, I had finance training as, at my, in my MBA program, but I was not a finance person, you know, like I was not a, um, but that was something that I embraced as a challenge. It was sort of an opportunity for me to come in, run, run the books, you know, run the financial function um, and develop in the business develop, you know, into the sort of more uh, holistic business function. Um, and so it's been great, you know, and today, day to day, I, you know, I effectively help lead the, the entire business side for our operation. And that's, doing content partnerships and deals. So with creators that we might partner with, um, you know, I, I do all of our distribution agreements, really any kind of like any contract that we sign with anyone and that's sort of inbound or outbound um, I'm working on. And I'm always trying to think about, um, you know, one of the ways I guess I, I conceptualize is like, we have a, an amazing group of producers, you know, that Brittany works with and I like they have ideas. We have inbound ideas. I think of my job is to like make sure that we can fund and and you know build successful business around the ideas that we want to make. Um, and that doesn't mean every idea is going to be a success or you know a huge home run financially. But um, if we have a passion for it, like the the group just you know they're, they're gonna they make amazing things. So you know it's my role to help make sure people hear them and and that we make some money from them. Thank you for that brief summary. That was super informative. And now for, so for Brittany, we kind of wanted to ask you a similar question, but as an associate producer, I think your day-to-day -day looks a little bit different. So we were also curious about your day-to-days, but also what do you look for when you're developing and searching for story episodes? And also if you could talk a little bit more about the work you're doing on the podcast, Be Anti-Racist with Ibrahim X. Kendi. So just like talk about those experiences if you could. Um, sure. So well, right now we're in the very early stages of production. And so it's a lot of logistics, logistics that you have to work out when it comes to creating a new show. I mean, like even production workflow where we're, there are a lot of docs that are involved. Um, you have to make sure, you know, everybody's on the same page. Scheduling is a really big thing. You have to uh, kind of block out um, and, and determine episode ideas. You have to, you know, continuously be communicating with the, uh, with the hosts. Um, and what he or she has um, as a vision for the podcast and making sure that you kind of want to stay along that track in order to, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to uh, disrupt the vision of, of, of who you're working with or her working for. And so it's a very much a collaborative effort. And because of that, it's, 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 not, it's a, it's a time where a lot of creativity can, can, can blossom from that. So we have uh, production meetings constantly on like a, probably like a, uh, probably like three times a week at least, especially now that we're in the early stages, we're talking about technical stuff. We're talking about um, potential interview dates for folks uh, and our guests. We're talking about what types of guests that we wanna have. And so it's like all the nut and nuts and bolts uh, are happening now with the, with the show Be Anti-Racist. And I think that, you know, once you get into the production mode, once you get into like a nice rhythm, and things are things tend to unfold and you know everybody tends to have has their space and know exactly what is expected of everyone and then it's it's, it's like a, a it's like a nice song you know everybody's doing what they need to do in order to create this like masterpiece um so that's where we're at now um and it's exciting it's it's exciting because all the anything goes and you know we're picking music and we're picking you know show art and like you know we're really like making this thing from the ground up and so to be a part of a podcast in this fashion is is new even for me usually I come come uh I mean besides beyond the last dance it's usually like something that um is already kind of in motion and so to be able to kind of like um be a part of a project that's literally like 
a little infant, a little embryo <laughs> um, is really, really cool. And everybody's has like a vital role in making sure it can be the best podcast it can possibly be. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm also just like curious about how the collaborative process looks like that for that because you have a team and I think mm. I'm used to just working either by myself or with one other person. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious about what it looks like to be working with a team of people. Um, it's good. I mean, it's just, it's a lot of like, just kind of brainstorming. It's a lot of referencing things that you enjoy already. Those, those are always like good examples to throw in. So like if we're in a Zoom or if we're, you know, or even if something comes up, maybe we'll slack it to one another and be like, hey, this, this idea came to mind or hey, have you guys listened to um, this podcast that uh, has this kind of tone? And I think I like the music for this one. And so you're constantly referencing things that you already enjoy. And like everybody comes with their own kind of viewpoint. And after that, like you, we kind of gauge like where we want to, where we want to go with it. And I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of docs that are created in order to make sure we are organized in that way. So if we have a creative brief doc, we have a doc where we maybe we'll, you know, create like potential bonus content, just other things like that. And, and, and to put all the ideas in a space where they live and they can constantly be developed upon is helpful. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So our next question is about how, so we've kind of spoken about how you have each kind of broken into the podcasting industry, um, but based on your experiences and like your colleagues, would you say that there are any specific tracks for breaking into the industry? And John, you can talk a little bit more about this first. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this a little bit because, you know, um, the industry is growing a ton. And so I guess one way I'd answer it is to say that they're, they're, the ways to break in are, are also multiplying, you know, by leaps and bounds, right? So there are different types of companies that are, you know, that are arising. There are, you know, the number of sort of production shops or um, support shops that kind of can plug into the space. Um, there are, there's certainly sort of like roles or sort of like broad functional areas that I think, um, make the most like so product like coming up as a producer like what we producers kind of like i, I feel like a, sometimes a little bit of a catch-all and like but mm -hmm. it really is it's the folks making the shows right and so you know like a role like britney's in this sort of production kind of core production track um a lot of folks at least at pushkin and i think historically and some of this has to do with just like the way the industry has developed come out of public media um some are coming out of other i mean britney's uh experience is actually not, not unique necessarily, but like you, you weren't like at NPR necessarily, you know what I mean? So, right. but coming from TV, you know, um, things like that, even, even advertising, like if you know how to edit, if you know how to work with the, the kind of key tools, there's a path there. Um, the other track I, I always think about is engineering, what we call, what we call engineering, but it's essentially that can be sound design. It can be mix, mixing and mastering. Um, it's, it's the more technical components mm -hmm. of the audio sort of fi final product. Um, you know, there's more, there's, then there's kind of the more traditional media business functions, right? So marketing, um, we, our marketing team is growing a lot right now, you know, so we're adding folks there. Um, and then, you know, the, the business bucket. <laughs> so the bucket that I fall in, which, you know, it's certainly finance. Like I actually think Pushkin, we're, we're probably on the larger end of production companies, certainly independent uh, podcast production companies. So we, we do have a defined, you know, we have a finance lead now, a woman that I work with pretty closely. Um, we have an analytics person, dis discipline. It's a one person discipline right now, um, small but mighty. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of ways in, I think, um, having a passion is really important and being like willing to learn that I think to, and maybe Brittany can speak to it. Like there's places you can learn the skill, like the kind of technical skills, um, which I know some of the folks that at Pushkin have come out of, but I don't know, Brittany, if you have advice on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. To, so to be like what you were saying about the technical skills that does help and to, and to, you don't necessarily have to, I mean, some, some folks come into, come into a field and know exactly what they want to do and exactly, you know, and they from start to finish and that's what they pursue. Um, but also if you do choose that you want to pivot, that's, that's also an avenue too. So that's something that I did. I, I had an interest, maybe a kind of like late, late in the game. And then I pivoted into some, another interest. And because of that, I was able to just look up, look, look up classes or look up uh, just things on the internet about how to edit. And so I, I taught myself how to edit. I taught myself 
um, how to edit in Pro Tools. I taught myself how to edit in, in, in Adobe, you know, and there's, you know, there's so many resources that are available nowadays that you can literally just teach yourself anything. And I think with the right amount of time and effort, um, you can you can find something. And then also, as John said, having a passion and doing something on the side, people always respect and admire what you do, even on your own, just because it's something that you enjoy. And so to that point, I would say, it's also about like, everything is about relationships. So if you're surrounding yourself with people who are like-minded or, or surrounding yourself with people who are interested in the thing that you want to do and making those connections, you'd be surprised as to what you can learn and what direction they can point you in in order to get on the track that they're on or, or in order to help you get on your own track and pursue exactly what you want to do. So I would say that that's the main thing. Just start speaking about what you want to do if you're not necessarily in podcasting or in it yet, or if you're not fully engulfed in it yet, like just start going to groups, maybe looking up stuff online and researching folks who are, who are doing what you want to do. And that helps, that helps a, a ton. Yeah, that's really good advice. I feel like, especially for people in the audience or even just Lily and I who are burgeoning audio documentarians, I guess you would say. So do you have any other tips, John or Brittany, for um, audio students who want to get their foot in the door? If you could just share your thoughts. Well, I, I mean, what Brittany just said, like, I think there's a unique opportunity when you are a student that you, you know, if you have the bandwidth in your schedule, or if you can make the band, you know, the, the bandwidth at the time, you have the space, right? Like you're never, <laughs> I, I, college students, I remember somewhat being a college student at this point. Um, you probably get sick of hearing it, but like you, you really don't ever have as much time, you know, maybe if you like come out like I did and don't have a job right away, you have a lot of time too. I, you know, I had that period. So, um, you know, I mean, so it is like, yeah, I mean, as Brittany said, like there's no substitute for doing it. Like there is a level of, you just gotta kind of like start chipping away at it. Um, you know, I think there's like an idea that I mean, like when the, when the space was smaller, it was like easier to get in that's true only in so far as like, maybe it was easier to get noticed because there just weren't that many people doing it. I mean, so like my, my hobby show that I do is it's a horror movie podcast. We, we were just like there doing it early and like, we've been doing it for a long time. And so like people, you know, so I don't know that we're particularly good. Um, but you know, so, but that said, like the, the number of people who have come to the space as consumers, um, has, grown exponentially um, and the tools and just like the different, like all the resources have grown exponentially. So I don't know if there's any better advice. I mean, I love Brittany's advice about networking too. I mean, it's really hard, it's hard work. Like it's not, it's, it's, there's no, there's no faking it, you know, but um, it's really important. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for that advice. So we've kind of talked a little bit about ways to break in and, you know, both of your individual paths. We're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and talk a little about pitching. So this next question, <laughs> your raised eyebrows, John. <laughs> this next question is uh, geared towards you. Um, so what does pitching a podcast look like at Pushkin? And do you have any tips for people who wanna pitch their podcasts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I can speak to it a little bit, right? So I'm on the business side. I'm typically, my role in the pitch process is something has been pitched and the, the creative, the sort of like creative lead, there's a sort of small group of folks who kind of sifts through the pitches and, and decides, you know, what they want to pursue. And when, once they've said like, yes, this is something I want to do, like, that's when they'll, they'll bring me in to kind of, I got, then it's like, you got to figure out the deal. That's my, my role. Um, do I have advice? So I think pitching to Pushkin is like a specific thing. I mean, like we're, um, you know, we're, we're looking for very specific types of things. We're looking, we, you know, we're working with specific talent. A lot of the time is like a big thing for Pushkin. So if you look across most of our shows, there's typically like a recognizable name attached to them. You know, I mean, Mal Malcolm Gladwell is one of our co-founders, you know, fairly prominent writer and journalist, you know, and so you kind of like look down the, the roster and it's, we, we do look for, you know, big, so, one joke I used to make, and it's like less and less true. I said, uh, you want a Pushkin podcast, you got to be a New Yorker writer or, uh, you know, an Ivy League uh, professor. We've expanded beyond that a little bit. Now, I mean, I'm joking, but um, we still like, that's still a core group for us in a lot of ways. Um, 
when so I, in some ways I would answer the question maybe a little bit um, in, in a little bit of a more generic or broader fashion, which is to say, there are just an infinite number of places that you can take an interesting idea. Um, the you know nowadays, right? And so that's everything from um, sort of like grant writing organizations who fund arts and and projects like that, um, and then it's every other podcast sort of production group, you know, and and they run the gamut from public media all the way through to, to sort of private companies, and and then even some big publicly held companies that have you know podcast production arms. Um, I think the key thing is understand the audience. Who are you pitching to, um, and and tailor your pitch, right? So like we we have a, a generic pitch email address. I think it's pitches at or something. You know, I mean it's very generic. And so you can imagine the things that come in through that. Like it's like everything under the sun. Um, and a lot of them just feel like shotgun pitches. Like ah, like I've teed up this pitch and I'm gonna like send it dear sir or madam, like here, you, you know, I mean, so I think understand who you're pitching to and, and try to understand like why it's the right home. You know, I mean, the shotgun approach, like I, I know why people do it. Like I've done it with my resume, you know, you're just like, I'm going <laughs> to spray them out and see what happens. Um, but if you really want to, you know, I think especially in a creative endeavor, you want to find the right production partner and, and look, not everybody can be choosy, but that's, I, so it's like, I get it, but um, either, either way, like the more, t the more sort of like effort you put in, the better that's gonna go. And then look, like we, we just talked about it a little bit, but networking um, never hurts, right? So like, you know, I, people will reach out to me, like it happened, like, and, and I just like in general, and they'll be like, yeah, well, you know, can we talk about podcasts? And like, if it's someone I don't know at all, I will ignore them. If it's someone that I know through a connection, like cool, I'm always happy to like talk to people. Ultimately, like it's not my decision anyway. I'm not, I don't lead creative, I don't own that, but I'm always happy to kind of like talk about it. And if I think it's interesting, like I'll pass it along. But like what that what that counts for is like to you know debatable. Um, but I don't know. I mean, so hopefully that's a little helpful. I like the I think having some audio really, really, really helps. Um, having unique audio really, really helps, right? So this, and again, I guess if, if you want to know what Pushkin looks for, it's like, what's that piece of tape that like someone can't get anywhere else or that will truly make this product stand out? Um, you know, I think, again, that's sort of when we think about talent, a lot of times, like that's why we sort of gravitate to that, to that talent that either has an audience they can bring with them or truly has like a unique perspective. Like everybody can, you know, a lot of people could do a show about sort of racial inequity and you know racism in modern America, like, but working with Ibram Kendi is like, this is you're going to do like the show about you know these issues. I mean, he, you know, and he's his own brand. I mean, that's like a, a different thing in some ways. But um, but those are you know that's that's one way to get a Pushkin show is uh, build a build an academic career about anti racism and, and we, we'd be excited to work with you. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'll just become a professor quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> so yeah, just, <laughs> just keep my number and yeah. I wanna... <laughs> right. <laughs> so for Brittany, um, we were, you know, talking earlier about, you know, being like an early professional, um, like I'm graduating soon. And you said something in like one of our other meetings about how it's also about pitching yourself and like how, and we've talked about networking and kind of getting your foot in the door and just like being curious and just going ahead and just getting started and working on things. But do you also have just um, ways that you keep yourself grounded and remind yourself that you're capable? Um, I feel like that's important too, to like nurture and care for yourself in the yeah. midst of like rejections or <laughs> this uncertain time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I can, I feel like it's, it's easy to get discouraged along the way, especially if you can't quite, I mean, we all have a path, but we don't know exactly like <laughs> what that looks like, you know? So, but we have this thing that we want to get to. It's like, we can see the mountain and we want to be like on top of the mountain, but it's like all this stuff in the way. And so I would say you got to remember, like, for me, what I do is I try to remember what, what got me excited about what I want to do in the first place. And so if I come back to that each and every time, it's like, okay, I wanted to do this because it not only was it fun, but I thought that I was going to be like inspiring people. I thought that I was, you know, going to be trying to uh, trying to like teach something to the world and provide something that is of use. 
And, and so when I come back to that, it's like, okay, like all that other stuff, all the no's or all the, you know, the, the, the you don't get called back. So people say they're going to help you and they don't. And that's part of it because it builds character and it gets you, you know, it kind of builds a tough skin and then you're able to really appreciate the art that you do make because if you do anything long enough I think and you 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 know you grind it out and you do it it will you it will whatever you want will come to fruition but you have to keep going and have to know that it's like an inner knowing it's like it's, it's intuitive you know that this is what you want to do and if you put the energy uh, behind that and you surround yourself with people who are like-minded and they're, they're they're go-getters and they want the same things as you I think that that's 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 like that's like more than half the battle like john talked about how he, he's had a podcast for like 100 years or something i don't know <laughs> it feels like it a lot of the time actually <laughs> right so he said he's been doing this for forever but him and his friends have been that's a commitment that's a that's 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 hard work like to hold each other accountable in that way but you want to have people in your corner who will hold you accountable even when you don't feel like doing this or you you know you don't you don't see the point anymore and you know he does it for, it's a hobby and he does it for fun and people obviously enjoy it you know so that's a good example and even um the content that I create like with Barbara Jean Productions I work you know and I work with my brother and you know we do the stuff and we make stuff because we think it's cool we think it's fun and then other people think it's cool and fun. And then when you, when other people think it's cool and other people think that you're doing it, it's like, oh, really? Wow, I just do this sometimes like <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon. When, like, you know, everybody else is like at the bar or whatever, you know? So it's like, it's about just doing those things and, and being committed to what you enjoy and not really caring what anybody else thinks, you know? I mean, you're open to criticism or constructive criticism and feedback. And you always want to, you know, also talk to folks who have, who are doing the thing that you want to do too. And like, it's important to have mentors and stuff like that. So they can kind of help guide you and, and, you know, give you some words of wisdom and advice and things like that. But that's, that's part of it. That's like the, even though it seems like the hardest part, that's like the funnest part of that, of creating and being a creative is that whole process. Cause then you could talk about it and be like, man, we didn't have any money, but now we have like $100, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Wow, I need that pep talk like saved <laughs> so I can refer back to it. We are <laughs> recording so, this session, Arlene. Right. So. You're, well, you're right, you're right. I'll, I'll definitely be coming back, <laughs> be coming back to this. That was kind of similar. You, you started to answer another question that we had. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. go ahead and jump to that one. And so mm -hmm. essentially, we wanted to ask about like navigating your draw, which is also inherently creative, right? But also navigating and balancing that with things that you're passionate about. So Brittany, for you, it's Barbecue Productions. For John, it's Bloody Good Horror. So what, I guess, what are the ways that you, you find joy and are able to find that balance? And also the crossover between those two. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I'll say, you know, you kind of got to get into like a, a routine, a rhythm. Um, you know, if you're going to find a way that in a way that you want to do both, then, you know, wh whatever your full, wh whatever your full-time commitment is, if it is a full-time job or a full-time freelance gig, then, you know, you are committed to that during how many hours that you're committed to that. But, in, the, in your free time, um, you know, or your leisure time, it can, that can be used for doing something productive that you want to get done on your own or on the side. So if it's a couple of hours after work, or maybe it's a couple of hours, in, you know, in the morning before you start your actual work, or, or maybe it's a couple of hours in the afternoon, depending on your schedule. Um, but you just got to kind of find a balance and, and routine helps, I think, like, whatever that may be, like, I mean, you guys are in school. So it's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the thing that is, I think school, like aside from anything else, I know you, we learn a lot in school, but I think it's the discipline. It's the showing up to class and going to class and doing the homework when you have time. Like it's, it's, it's teaching you everything you need to know, like in terms of time management for when you get out into the world. That's all it really does to me. I mean, I know like people who are doctors and like all that stuff is great, but like <laughs> we're gonna make a podcast. So it's like, you know, it's not rocket science. So it's like, if you can find like a couple hours out of your day, after you've like, I don't know, been in a couple of Zoom meetings all day, if you can still like just jot some stuff down or like, you know, or have another Zoom meeting with your friend or your other creative partner, you can do that. And then if you do that often enough, you'll start to really make something cool. And, um, but you just, you just gotta hold yourself accountable, like I said earlier, and and really be, um, I'd say, uh, just have fun with it too. Like don't, cause it's because this is your creative space to like, if you're being creative, like, full time it is also hard to be I guess creative like again in your you know but just don't take it don't take it too seriously and just try to have fun and use that as like as your leisure time because it's something that is for you 
And if you treat it that way and, and, and approach it that way, it won't feel like, oh man, now I got to work on my stuff. It shouldn't feel like that because if it feels like that, it's like, okay, well, maybe you need to take a break. <laughs> well, you're not going to do it, right? You're, right, you're, yeah. You'll <laughs> you're find every excuse. Right. Yeah, I, I, pretty, I love the point about uh, having a routine. Like I never thought of myself as a routine person, but like you do, I mean, you do, right? Like part of like job, having a job, it gets you into a routine too. But um, for, if you do have a passion outside, like whether it's a hobby, you know, like mine, or if you're pursuing like legit creative stuff, like you, you, you I think you do have to find, make that space for it. And, and Brittany also mentioned earlier, but it, you're a hundred percent, right? Like part of it, at least for me and what I'm doing, it's like finding the right group and having, and that, that for, you know, for me, that's evolved over a decade plus, there's a core group of folks who started and some have peeled away a little bit there, you know, are still around in certain ways, but it's really like, who are the folks who are going to be kind of in that, that foxhole? I mean, it's not a battle, not, but you know, it's like, who's in this with you. Um, and who's also going to, who's willing to kind of also be on that same routine. Um, but I think the, the key with having a group, if you are trying to make something like, you know, a collective podcast like ours is you can spell each other. Like there are weeks where it's like, guys, I'm out. Like, I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't do it. Like, it's just, I got too much shit going on, like in personal life and work, whatever it is. Like I used to have to travel a lot for work and like, that was brutal, you know? And, and so I was in and out more than I wanted to be. Turns out when there's a pandemic, you can just, you can do a podcast every night if you want. I mean, there's, uh, but you know, so it is, it's tough. I mean, look, it's not, it's never easy. And if you don't have the passion, if you, and if, if you do feel like it's a slog, like I just, I feel like that's the death of it really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> wow. That was really great. Not to um, be grim, but. <laughs> no, no. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's realistic. Um, so the next question we have is because this is in partnership with here at Duke, which is our, stu our student run audio collective. And, you know, we're working with other students and we're working on um, helping them share their stories. And we're just curious about what are some of your strategies for small content groups like here at Duke to kind of build an audience and to build a following? Um, I say... <laughs> I mean, like, well, if you're starting like from scratch, like if you're just starting to, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's starting with uh, trying to touch the people who you already know, right? Like, you know, if you can reach out and, and touch folks and about that, I mean, I guess also virtually and like socially and things like that, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of this stuff is obviously through the internet, but it, all of it is like word of mouth too. So if it's, if it's people who you, who you know, and like, hey, I'm working on this thing and uh, yeah, I think it, I think it'd be dope if you could work on this with me. And so if, if it's a, that's that's what's dope about it being a collaborative effort is that you know people that other people don't know. And so if you start like a if you if you start like you know if you have an Instagram for it, if you if you if you're on Twitter or if you if you have um, like your own let's say website or what have you, like you can easily maybe share and or tweet out or tell people to like you know have like a whole campaign be like hey all all my uh friends are gonna tweet this out at like 7 p.m can you guys do this and retweet it you know what i mean like really like get people involved who you know and sooner or later the folks who you don't know will learn about the thing that you're doing and that's like that's what you want you want people who like you don't even know like how'd you wow i didn't even know this person how'd you find out about me like <laughs> i'm just like at duke like <laughs> in my dorm room or in my apartment or whatever whatever you know so it's i would think it's that i think really like hasn't changed um, i mean the internet's obviously something that we've like you know something that is like a huge asset but like you know i think if you have a like a something that's unique and something that or, or something that people can relate to or grab onto or that's just original like it, the people will come you know you just gotta you gotta create it I think I, I, that's like a very generic answer but it's true I think so oh I mean there are that it's like there's kind of like the core tactics of like get your your stuff out the yeah. thing and so we haven't had a chance I've, I've learned about here at Duke through this process so I'm excited to to learn more in the future um I kind of almost look, because I think one of the biggest challenge in student groups, and I experienced this in selective living life and then at the Chronicle, like it, it's true of any college, right? Like the students pass through, but the groups remain. And so they do, there's this turnover that's built into the entire process. So one of the things I guess I would think about, and again, without knowing a ton about how here at Duke is currently set up or structured, how you all think about the collaborative is 
you know, can you look to the Chronicle as like a model for, you know, an organization where you, and again, it's, it's different with podcasts, right? Because it's not, it's not a newspaper, although it's not, it doesn't need to be so different. I, so in some ways, what I would think about is like, so, and sorry to take a step back, but with podcasting, like the audience is an RSS feed, right? Like this, like it's, it's sort of basic. I hope this is not, it doesn't sound like I'm not being pedantic or anything, but like you have an RSS feed and you put content down the RSS feed and people subscribe to the RSS feed to get the podcast. There are other models for getting the content out there and like, but that's like 90 nine percent of podcasts are in that model um and so it's really a question of like how many rss feeds can you create and how big an audience can you create for those rss and so in some ways i guess where i was going with this sort of chronicle analogy is can you create one that is the here at duke feed or or you know a show that becomes kind of the tentpole that you will have the staff cycle through because you know every four years you're going to have a you know a completely new group, but where you have a model of sort of like leadership and you know ascension and replacement kind of built in, but that the show and the feed remains the same. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's the I mean uh, well, the the radio sh- uh, radio station RDU WRDU is that what it's called? There used to is there WXDU. still radio? WXDU. I should I should remember that I had You're a keychain. I was yeah I was just, you know, um, but XDU right like it's it's a similar model like so can you build that like core offering that can be maintained over time and then what you do once you have that core offering is you use that to seed other things. So in the case of like Arlene, you're developing a show that's like a narrative sort of like closed loop you know sh- short run you know narrative documentary it's really hard to like get those things out there. I mean, this is like, it's hard for like Pushkin to do this, to get them out there, to have them get found and to have them be successful. Like people will find it over time because it exists forever, but to have people find it in the moment is really, really tough. If you have a like feed, I keep coming back to this concept of an RSS, but like if you have an audience that subscribes to this main feed, you can use that to then seed other feeds, right? And so those could be short runs, those can be net new shows in different, you know, content areas. Um, but, you know, it's hard because I'm sure, you know, the students that come after you three, four years later, like they might not like the show that you've developed and built. Um, the hope is you find something that can be fresh for everyone and can have a different voice, but be the container that everyone can fit into. I don't know. That's like a pretty specific idea, but hopefully it gives you uh, a little bit of starting place. No, definitely. And I think I think it gives us a lot to think about, especially since we kind of restarted this group this year. It had been inactive for a couple of years. So I think we're just figuring out ways to like best set the structure so that when I leave and when other people leave, it can be something that can be like replicated when we leave. So yeah, great advice. Um, so we have a couple more questions, but I kind of want to do them rapid fire to not... Um, take up too much time so the next question we have is for both of y'all what are the pros and cons of producing a podcast through a production company versus independently and I think this is something that Lily and I are thinking about because you know we're working on that series and eventually some point in the distant future we'll be thinking about pitching it so if you could just quickly say um, the pros and cons the pros are that someone else is paying for it that's the pro (laughs) so um but I think, look, like the other big pro to consider is is just sort of getting back to the the point I was just making is like a network or if someone's paying you for the podcast, like they're also going to help get the podcast out and, and get people to hear it. Um, so usually the trade-off, the, the usually, and again, I do the deals. So like, I know what the trade-offs are because I'm like writing them into the contracts often it is just creative control or ownership, right? And so like um, most... Con, uh, content creators, I think, are comfortable with the creative trade-off because, and this kind of gets all the way back to the question about pitching, you should really be trying to find who's the right partner. Like, don't just take dumb money or don't take anybody's money. Don't like, I don't want to, I'm not going to make any political comments. Like, but don't take, you know, don't take money from just anyone who's out there making podcasts. Um, you know, find someone who's aligned to your vision and and like who, who creates the kind of content you want to be a part of. Um, but so, and if you do that, the, the the creative control part tends to be, I think, less of a concern. You know, ownership is a big one, right? And I think Arlene, for you, you know, you're working on something that's personal. Like, 
that's like even more important. And I think you got to find the partner or the financer, financier who will um, respect the, the personal aspect of your story. You know, I mean, that's, that's, I don't know, Brittany, I don't know if, if there's other stuff on yeah, yeah, I would I would agree with that. Like the the creative control part is something that you'll kind of have to sacrifice. Not sacrifice, but there are things that are just you know you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna always see eye to eye with a bigger I guess uh, company or if you go through like a, a bigger like a network over even if it's a partnership. Like there are things that you're gonna have to kind of um, not sacrifice. But I would just you know you would. You're gonna have to. It's almost like any type of relationship. You're gonna have to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know. You know. You're gonna have to kind of compromise. That's the word I'm looking for. You're gonna have to compromise. So, that's one thing. And I would say, I guess, doing something independently is, I guess, mainly about like budget and like, you know, you want to be if you're working in a, in a collaborative thing. If it's something that you want people to be able to make to make some some money for their time. If it, I mean, it can be an understanding that this is just a passion project or a hobby and things like that. But, you know, depending on what people. You know, depending on who you're working with and what what you really want to do, I think that you really want to be in a position to kind of like, you know, have some type of people get something for the time that they put into helping you with this or even in vice versa. Um, so those are the two things that like jump out. But and also just doing the hard, just doing the work, doing the heavy lifting. Like maybe like you don't have like a six or seven person team and maybe it's only like three of you. And so it's like if one of you is, you know, maybe not feeling it and, you know, you got to pick up the slack or, you know, things like that. Like, so I would say those are the things that kind of jump out at me. Actually. Great. OK, so. Just want to remind you guys that these are some rapid fire questions. So right. we'll, <laughs> next... we'll stop. Well, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so the next question is what are your favorite, your favorite Pushkin podcast and your favorite non Pushkin podcast and briefly why? Brittany, uh, you go first. Okay. My favorite Pushkin podcast is broken record and my non favorite Pushkin. I mean, my non favorite uh, non Pushkin podcast <laughs> is this uh, show called The Read. That's great, really funny stuff. Um, they're great, so yeah. <laughs> uh, my favorite show, so currently Cautionary Tales is probably my favorite one that's, that's sort of active. Um, another shout out I wanted to give was a show we did back last summer called Into the Zone. Kind of, it did, I felt like it, it just, it didn't have like, it didn't hit the way we were kind of hoping, but I think it's it's just an incredible like audio thing it's it's wild it's with the the writer Hari Kunzru who's like such a unique personality and just the way that show sounds is amazing um so I really like it uh oh man like my non-pushkin podcast listening has like dwindled terribly during the pandemic um I'll give a shout out and this is a Duke related one um Adam Schlossman uh, works for religion of sports they have a their first show just came out called crushed it's about the um uh, steroid era in baseball. And, uh, I, I only listened to the first episode today. It came out maybe like a week or two ago, really solid. So I liked the crush. Um, and then I like the, I listen to a, like sp my, I've kind of like transitioned sports talk radio to podcasting. So I like Zach Lowe. He's my, that's my dude when it comes to NBA. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in like, I think we're just going to go ahead and move to some audience questions. So one of the first ones that we, one of the ones that we see here from Colleen, how do you respond when an idea or concept flops? Have you had that happen before? And how did you respond from that? I mean, Pushkin, we've, we've had, I mean, we've, yeah, I just mentioned into the zone, like, didn't, it just, I guess flop is like a pretty tough question. Like, um, because things can not work creatively, but like they can also, at least from my perspective, not work financially, you know? Um, and, and I think when you're in, on the business, it's like, you just, that's a really, it's a hard thing. And like, it's a hard conversation to have as a group, but like, that's part of, you know, Brittany talked about working collaboratively with folks. Like that's also part of the agreement. It's like, look, we're all going to be honest with each other mm -hmm. if things are not working. So, yeah. Do you have anything to add, Brittany? Um, no, not really. I don't know if I can speak to anything like flopping or. 
Brittany, oh, it's, it's all right if you only do home runs. Like we get no, it. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm saying, I mean, I've been like reject. I haven't been accepted into things, or I've, or like my like 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 my films have been like this isn't specific to podcasts, you know. Um, they've not been admitted into like maybe like a festivals or something like that, and then you kind of feel like, wow, what was the point? But it's uh, but you just keep making stuff, and you keep um, you know, if it doesn't work, it's you know, maybe it just either wasn't the right time or you know, for whatever reason, folks didn't receive it and it didn't do well. And you just kind of got to just take it as a learning, uh, a learning experience and try to maybe just do, do, do better the next time. And just, you know, and, and, but appreciate like what it, like John said, he really appreciated, it. appreciate it for what it was. And, and if you gave your best effort and it just, you know, it wasn't well received and this, that's okay. But you, at least you gave it your best. At least you can say like, okay, we really did try it. Uh, we did really did try to do this and if it doesn't happen or if it doesn't you don't have another season or recurring uh, or you know a season two th- or what have you like that's okay it's just for whatever reason but just yeah just take it as a learning experience and keep 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 going dust yourself off and try again it's fun. <laughs> yeah that was great okay so in 10 words or less each of you what inspires you creatively Twenty words or less. <laughs> I have to count the words. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, that's a it's a really hard question. I I love new ideas. I love things that like sound new. Um, you know, I think about the movies that I that like. I mean, obviously, I do a horror movie podcast, so like, there's a lot of not new stuff going on there. But um, the movies that I'm like really passionate about are, I think, tend to be things that uh, transgressive is like too strong. But like you know, try to push the envelope and like do something, you know, mm-hmm. tell stories in different ways or tell unique stories, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say just the people around me or, um, sorry, other people around me and, uh, um, and even my family, um, you, you'd be surprised as to like what comes out of like, just knowing different types of people and, being able to grab certain experience would be if you're close to certain, you know, certain folks and, you know, an idea may come to mind, but that's something that maybe like your mom's friend's sister said one time, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. Um, and I feel like it creates a more authentic voice that way too. Yeah, that was great. Okay. So the next question is what's next for each of you? I mean, not that, you know, you're leaving your jobs or anything, or there's some drastic announcement, but what are exciting things coming up in the works? I mean, I'm just trying to survive day to day in this (laughs) pandemic we got going on. (laughs) Uh, uh, I'm going to move my family back to New York City. I lived in New York City for 15 years and, and I've relocated. I uh, I was joking with Arlene and and the crew earlier. I'm living with my in-laws. It is a we're, it's actually a multi-generational Duke family. So, you know, we're, we're staying strong, but uh, I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to go back to New York. That's a big one for me. Um, and you look, Pushkin, we're growing a ton. I mean, uh, so l- this time last year, we were probably like 20 people and we're like 48 today. Um, you know, so we, and we did that, we did that during the pandemic. I mean, so, you know, Brittany and I, we worked together on the NBA show and, and, um, you know, now she's, you know, here you are, you're on staff. We've never met in person, you know, so, right. like, um, <laughs> but that's true of like half the people we work with, you know, I've never met, um, almost everyone in person. So that's next. I'm, I'm very excited to get back and just hang. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited about uh, the new podcast, Be Anti Be Anti Racing. I'm excited about that. And it's not announced yet. We should tell the audience. Oh like, yeah, please. Uh, I think that's the next week. Yeah. yeah, it's gonna be announced soon. It's not like a huge secret, but like we ask for your discretion uh, right now. Yeah, maybe like two weeks. Um, and um, summer, like I'm excited about summer. I'm excited about summer because <laughs> it seems like maybe we can have like somewhat of a semi normal summer. And um, I'm excited about like a couple, like a film I did is starting to get some recognition and festivals, some sh- short film I did, I'm so excited about that. And um, and also I think I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go to the office for the first time, John on Monday with uh, Sasha. Um, so we're gonna do that. And I was talking Huge. to her about that. Monday morning commute that I haven't done uh, in like a year and a half. So that'll be yeah. fun. <laughs> Good luck. 
I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today, but I just wanted to thank you so much for giving us your time and chatting with us. I learned so much and I hope our audience learned so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Lily just to wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, wow. Okay. A big thank you again to our panelists for tonight. I feel like it was a gift for me and all the other Dukies here to hear they're like very empathetic and grounded and real, but also encouraging advice. So wonderful to meet you. And also Arlene killed it as our moderator and fielding our audience questions. So claps for her. Um, so we did mention a few times this is recorded. It's recorded. You can stream it after the fact, um, along with more episodes of Demon Live about so many different topics. They're all so good. At the link Nina just dropped in the chat, um, arts.duke.edu slash demon. Um, and to anyone, not just students, um, who'd like to join our audio collective or just get in the know about it, you can subscribe to the Here at Duke newsletter, get a preview of some of our soon to be released projects, or just send us your like burning questions at the links and email in the chat. Um, thank you everyone again for joining us. It's been a great evening. Um, a shout out to all our collaborators who Nina will put up on the screen in a second. They helped us get the word out. Uh, everyone stay safe and stay well, and we hope to see you again soon in this virtual demon space. It's a wrap. <laughs>